Welcome everyone to today's webinar, Centrifugal Elutriation Utility in the Flow Cytometry Laboratory. My name is Randy Lochner and I'm the Strategic Marketing Manager for Centrifugation at Beckman Coulter. We're delighted to bring you this educational seminar presented by LabRoots and sponsored by Beckman Coulter Life Sciences. Beckman Coulter is a world leader in centrifugation and flow cytometry and has long been an innovator in particle characterization, laboratory automation, and genomics. Beckman Coulter products are used at the forefront of important areas of investigation and discovery. For more information, please visit BeckmanCoulter.com. We have a few important announcements before we begin. This webcast is designed to be interactive. We encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button in the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen in the lower right hand corner of the slide window. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the support button on the top right of your presentation window or submit your problem to the green Q&A button in the lower left. And now I'd like to introduce today's speaker. Peter Lopez is currently a research assistant professor in pathology at the NYU School of Medicine and is the director of the NYU LMC flow cytometry facility. He has published over 30 scientific articles or book chapters and serves on the executive council of the International Society for the Advancement of Cytometry and the executive board of the Association for Biological Resource Facilities. Peter's career has been devoted to utilizing flow cytometry to facilitate research in biological sciences, and his interest in designing new applications has led to his lab's current research into utilizing centrifugal elutriation in the flow cytometry core facility. Before we go to the presentation itself, we have a few poll questions that we'd like to ask our audience. Please take a few seconds to respond to the questions on your screen now. The first question is simply, do you operate flow cytometers? Oh, wow. So we have a majority of the audience that does have experience with flow cytometry. Not surprising, given the topic. The next question is, do you have experience with centrifugal elutriation, or what some may know as counterflow centrifugation? Also a somewhat expected result and we're very happy to be able to introduce you to the concept. Final question before we turn it over to, to Dr. Lopez. Do you work in a core facility environment? Thank you very much for taking the time to answer these poll questions. And please, if you do find the webinar content interesting, uh, share the information with your colleagues. 
At this point, I'd like to turn over the virtual podium to Professor Peter Lopez. Peter, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Randy. And uh, uh, thank you all for joining uh, in on our webinar today. And uh, in particular, I'd like to thank Beckman Coulter for uh, sponsoring it and for their support uh, in, in uh, the work that's going on in our lab uh, related to uh, centrifugal elucidation. So uh, I'd like to start by um, uh, actually reviewing the poll. It looks like we've got uh, a good number of folks who are using uh, flow cytometry, uh, about 60%, it looks like. I think everyone has probably seen these. I think they, they, they get pushed out to the audience. Uh, we have um, uh, about a quarter of the people on the call have used an elutriator, which is great. Um, 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 anticipating some interesting questions from those folks. And, uh, and we uh, have about a third of the folks uh, uh, on the call at the moment who are working in a core shared uh, resource facility kind of environment. Uh, the goal of this presentation, in a way, is to potentially draw all three of these groups together uh, with, uh, with, uh, with uh, the utility of uh, elutriation in, in, a, in a flow cytometry course specifically. So uh, let me start with my first slide. Uh, and I'm just having a little trouble bringing that up. Uh, okay, we'll go next. Okay, so um, centrifugal elucidation, uh, as Randy mentioned, is also known as counterflow centrifugal elucidation. It's a, a, a biophysical uh, cell separation technique in which the size, and uh, I'm sorry, one second, guys. Uh, I, okay, got it. Uh, I had something on my screen. Uh, uh, so so uh, we're, we're, the, the system uses sedimentation density differences in living cells uh, as a means of, uh, of purification and for isolating cellular subpopulations. Um, the benefits, uh, there, there are a number of benefits, uh, and benefits in, in separation compared to other techniques. Uh, you can purify cells without the need for labeling. So this is kind of powerful in that you don't have to uh, process the cells uh, in any way uh, uh, before, before separating these cells. Um, you can purify large numbers of cells, uh, and uh, it's been reported on, in some situations where you can process billions of cells. Uh, and you know, there are other techniques that we'll talk about where this is possible. Uh, it's certainly a little challenging in the flow cytometry cell sorting environment to do this type of, uh, these type of numbers. And uh, lastly, one ben uh, benefit is that uh, this purification is done with uh, minimal stress on the cells. Uh, the, the primary stress is the g-force of the centrifuge. And we'll talk a little bit about that, about what the g-forces are that are involved uh, as we go uh, further into the talk. So, uh, basically, centrifugal elucidation, uh, uh, there are two opposing forces that come into play in a specialized uh, centrifuge uh, rotor and chamber. Uh, there's the centrifuge force that's generated by the spinning rotor, and this is the standard kind of G-force that we use for pelleting cells uh, in, a, in a tube and for uh, other uh, you know, kind of standard centrifugal um, um, applications. Uh, the differentiator here is a, uh, in the apparatus, is the ability to counterflow fluid in the opposite direction of the g-force, so it's the centripetal uh, direction. And uh, these two forces uh, kind of can reach an equilibrium and cells uh, will find their little niche where they want to sit and it's dependent on the sedimentation velocity of the cells. So uh, to illustrate this, uh, we have this, this drawing, and you can see uh, what we're illustrating here is the, uh, the, um, uh, is the actual um, chamber of the, of the elucidator. And um, there's uh, the, the vertical line that you're, that you're seeing there is the, um, um, is, is the um, hold on, I can, I can illustrate this, I think. Uh, which is right here. Uh, this is the area that is the elutriation boundary. Um, and uh, during loading, uh, the cells have a tendency to uh, want to be moved out 
uh, in the direction of the centrifugal force, which would move things in this direction. Uh, but at the same time, you can see illustrated uh, a counterflow uh, through the small um, uh, the small path here, uh, and that eventually will flow in the opposite direction. And uh, this is done while the instrument, while the uh, centrifuge is uh, spinning. So that's uh, kind of an interesting change to what people typically expect in a centrifuge. Typically, you just put cells into the centrifuge and you spin them and you take them out. Uh, but in this case, you're loading cells into the centrifuge as well as removing them, uh, kind of as as it's spinning. Uh, and that's kind of the uh, one of the uh, one of the the, the, the uh, special aspects of the centrifugal nucleator. So um, this technology has been around um, in, at least uh, in its uh, theoretical uh, uh, applications uh, since the beginning of the 1900s. Uh, and uh, I illustrate uh, uh, the uh, Lindbergh here uh, with the H at the end of the name uh, uh, in parentheses. This is uh, kind of a funny little story because um, uh, there are a couple of references that point to Lindbergh with a G and not the H from a 1932 reference. And in finding this reference, it turns out that this is in fact Charles Lindbergh, uh, the pilot who in 1927 flew from New York City to Paris. And uh, surprising to me, and uh, possibly some in the audience know this story, but after, after his uh, transatlantic flight, uh, he ended up working uh, in uh, a laboratory at um, uh, Rockefeller University in, uh, in, in, in New York City, uh, working with Alexis Carell and a uh, tissue culture lab. And it is, in fact, Charles Lindbergh who devised the original counterflow uh, system, which was used for washing, uh, essentially. Uh, in, uh, but in the washing step, he was noting that uh, uh, back in the day, they were called uh, corpuscles, blood corpuscles, uh, cells, blood cells were, were retained in the chamber, and smaller particles were removed. Uh, and um, in between that initial observation by Lindbergh uh, and uh, there wasn't really that much centrifugal alliteration done because there, the apparatus wasn't available. Uh, so between 1932 and 1973, there wasn't a whole lot of alliteration work being done uh, until Beckman uh, Instruments uh, introduced the first commercially available centrifuge uh, alliterator. Uh, and uh, later refinements uh, were made. Uh, uh, in particular, th these refinements were in the chamber design. We'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, but the Sanderson chamber was designed in 1976, and that's one that is, is a popular chamber that's being used uh, in our lab uh, uh, in particular. So uh, just to show you uh, the, the proof in the pudding here, this is the original Lindbergh article. Uh, and you can see it's signed uh, Charles Lindbergh uh, showing his initial apparatus for doing uh, centrifugal alleviation. So moving this to the, the current uh, uh, systems, what we're looking at here is uh, a diagram of a uh, Beckman alliterator system. And this is, um, this is what we're actually using in our lab. Uh, and there are a number of uh, 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 points of, uh, on this system uh, that we can, we can uh, outline. Uh, first off, um, uh, we have uh, a specialized apparatus, which is the um, the elutriating uh, uh, chamber, which is uh, which is here, and um, then the um, uh, this is sitting in in a uh, a, a Beckman uh, uh, centrifuge, uh, and we have the ability to uh, to put material into the chamber. Uh, while it's spinning, as well as um, pulling material out of the chamber. So, so these things can, can happen um, in real time while the system's spinning. Typically, uh, for elutriator runs in most laboratories, uh, the centrifuge is uh, held at a constant rate, a constant spin rate. And um, the sample introduction rate, which is, can be uh, varied 
by, simply by uh, changing the uh, pump rate, uh, this will uh, act, this will allow you to uh, push material through and to actually uh, selectively remove smaller or, or larger cells from the from the system. So this is kind of the uh, the special uh, uh, the special apparatus that, that that's required to do this. Uh, one thing to note is everything related to the buffer reservoir, the pump, the pressure gauge, the sample injection, this can all be done in a hood. Uh, this can be kept sterile. This entire system can be kept sterile actually, which is, uh, which is an, an, interesting, um, an interesting point. Also, uh, you might uh, notice that the pump is behind the sample. Uh, the samples are, sample is injected in, uh, in this, um, in this uh, apparatus right here. Uh, the pump is behind that, which is a plus because the cells aren't uh, actually going through a pump. The pump is a peristaltic pump. Uh, they're typically pretty gentle on cells, but um, the fact that uh, the cells are not going through that pump at all is uh, clearly a benefit. So this is the actual setup that, uh, in our laboratory. And we can point out a few of the components here. Uh, the um, uh, first off, the uh, um, uh, uh, this is a uh, this is a Beckman Coulter Avanti J20 XPI centrifuge. It's ba it, it, it's a refrigerated centrifuge. Uh, it's kind of a uh, standard uh, 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 large uh, format centrifuge. Um, the XPI modification uh, helps uh, for the elutriation by uh, adding a, uh, a strobe light, which you can't see, but it sits underneath uh, the amber colored chamber. And this allows visualization uh, during loading. You can actually uh, see cells being introduced into this chamber. Uh, it's a strobed, uh, it's a strobed light, so it's in, it's in synchron, it's synchronized with the, um, with the spin rate, with the RPM rate, and uh, you can actually watch the cells being loaded. You can watch the, elutri the elutriation boundary being formed. Um, of course, this uh, this works when you're using uh, large numbers of cells, but it's very helpful in in uh, establishing loading conditions. In addition. Uh, uh, so, so by the way, this this uh, this uh, is is the rotor inside the uh, the um, uh, the centrifuge, and uh, this is really where all the action happens. Uh, that's uh, you can see lines coming into it. That's where the where uh, uh, cells and 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 elutriation fluid are being introduced, and uh, and then there's an other lines where the cells are uh, are being removed uh, selectively. Um, in addition, uh, in this picture, you can see that we have um, a, uh, a biosafety hood uh, that's set up, and in that hood, we can be uh, uh, keeping everything sterile um, and uh, introducing cells in a sterile environment, uh, as well as collecting cells in a sterile environment. So this is both for this. This is both for introduction as well as um, uh, collection of of, uh, of fractions. Uh, and uh, finally, we can uh, we should point out the uh, a, uh, the peristaltic pump, which is here, uh, and this is a really key uh, component to the system. Uh, it has to be calibrated accurately. Uh, this is going to be delivering uh, the cells initially into the chamber, and then subsequently running a lutriation buffer at different flow rates. And we'll talk a little bit more about how that. Uh, how that effectively removes uh, populations, uh, but it's a key component uh, to the system. Uh, just a little bit more of a close up. This is the um, this is the sample delivery area, and uh, in this area, the um, again in, in in a hood, uh, we we have a um, uh, we have a. a a magnetic stir, uh, and we put a little uh, stir bar into this uh, uh, this uh, uh, apparatus. The cells are being introduced uh, via 
uh, this uh, three-way, uh, uh, a syringe uh, loaded typically 10 mLs of material uh, concentrations of up to 10 to the 7th, 10 to the 8th, uh, 10 to the 6th uh, are introduced in, uh, at, at that point. And um, they actually uh, end up at the, um, in this little um, chamber here. Uh, and the goal there is to eliminate uh, any air in the system, uh, just like a flow cytometer, uh, centrifugal elutriators uh, really need to be free of air. Uh, air is a bad thing in, a, in an elutriator. So this helps to do that uh, in that the cells will uh, drip into that, into that uh, volume and uh, from there they, they're slowly introduced into the, into the system. Uh, from the uh, from the pressure from the pressure head coming from the, the peristaltic pump. Uh, this this again illustrates the the process of uh, introducing uh, material into the uh, in, into the elucidation chamber, which is uh, illustrated at the in the upper um, uh, the upper uh, illustration here. That, that would be the loading phase of of uh, of the of the uh, elutriation, actually getting the cells into uh, into the chamber, uh, and this is done while it's spinning. Uh, the cells are loaded uh, at a uh, flow rate that will uh, that that uh, will not oppose the centrifugal force significantly. So it's all uh, the, the the majority of the force on the cells are it's, it's the standard uh, the standard G force from the from the um, centrifuge. The um, centripetal force is minimal at this point, and you can see that uh, by our little uh, diagram here. Uh, and um, that is um, what uh, allows you to retain those cells in in the uh, in the chamber to get them loaded in the first place. And then with uh, uh, increasing uh, flow rates, uh, you know, this is after these cells have been loaded, with increasing flow rate uh, of elutriation buffer, we can start to differentiate uh, between smaller and larger uh, particles. And uh, one of the kind of uh, 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 Baseline ideas here is, is that the, the, the smaller cells will come out at, uh, uh, at uh, with a lower uh, 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 velocity of the uh, of the fluid, and the larger cells will be retained. And if you increase the the uh, the ml uh, mLs per minute of the of the fluid, you'll get more, the larger cells will come out. So they they come out uh, as fractions. And the image down here is 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 a the actual strobed image. Of, uh, of what's going on in the chamber, and uh, you can see the uh, uh, the triangular shaped chamber uh, in there, and you can actually make out the elutriation boundary, which is right. Oops, sorry, which is right there uh, at that point. So this is during the the, the loading, and then by increasing the uh, the throughput of the fluid, uh, the elutriation buffer, uh, we can push out uh, selected fractions. Uh, from, the, from, the, from this uh, mixture. So uh, why, are we, why do we want to do this in a flow cytometry facility? So that kind of gets back to the poll that we took earlier. Um, uh, I, I think we had about a third of the folks are uh, operating in core laboratories. Um, you know the, the the core laboratory uh, in in a lot of uh, that, that uh, you know these exist in a lot of academic centers and and they're really a repository for for knowledge and for the ability to uh, uh, have expertise in, in in a certain in a certain field uh, and uh, the flow cytometry uh, core laboratories. Um, uh, typically are doing analytical work, but, but a large portion of their work is involved with cell purification. And uh, we see elutriation, I mean, which is obviously a purification technique, as something that would make a lot of sense in a core environment. Uh, you know, this technology is fairly mature. It's, it's been around, like I, as I pointed out, you know, since the 
well, since the, since the first commercial instrument in the 70s. And um, more often than not, lutriation has been used for specific uh, experimental goals uh, for, for a, a particular application. And, and uh, the, the, the notion of a core laboratory can, can broaden this so that, it, it, that the elutriation is not used just for one application. It could be used for many applications. So, uh, you know, having it in a core and specifically a flow cytometry facility, uh, uh, this is where the expertise in configuring uh, an instrument like an elutriator for a number of applications, and there are a lot of applications that we'll, 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 we'll talk about briefly. Um, and you know, flow cytometry facility has to deal with cells because of the cell purification services that they offer. So uh, it seems like a logical place for something like an elutriator. Um, and uh, of course, one way of uh, looking at the success or, or, or identifying if, we're, if fractions are the appropriate fractions of interest, uh, you typically have to rely on a, on a flow cytometry to do the analytical side of things. So having that nearby, just made a lot of sense to us, and this is why we've uh, been trying to integrate this into our core facility offerings. So this is a, a, a comparison. You know, there are many techniques that can be used for um, for purification, and uh, we have flow cytometry by cell sorting, uh, which is one that we we like because we're a flow cytometry core. Uh, but there are other techniques, of course. There's max magnetic bead separation, and the comparison here with the uh, 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 CCE, kind of uh, centrifugal counterflow uh, lutriation. You know, Purity-wise, probably flow cytometry will, will, will always be the winner for that. Uh, you know, we, we sh in a flow cytometry cell sorting exper uh, experiment, um, you should uh, be able to to obtain 99% purity. Uh, that that, that uh, that's certainly obtainable. That's not uh, uh, that's not always the case, but but we should be able to obtain that. Uh, you probably will not get comparable purities uh, with elutriation, uh, uh, um, but you'll get you'll get relatively close uh, as as well as uh, magnetic bead uh, separation. Um, the um, um, uh, one one really big uh, differentiator here with the elutriation is uh, the um, uh, the number of cells that can be processed. Uh, ten to the ninth, ten to the tenth type cell populations can be processed. Um, that's uh, definitely something that is difficult to do in a flow cytometry cell sorting environment. Uh, in a, a magnetic bead environment, it can be difficult to do uh, unless you're using uh, multiple systems. And you know, actually, you can do it with multiple cell sorters. But uh, since a cell sorter is anywhere from two hundred thousand dollars U.S. to to a half a million or so, uh, having multiple units is is not a a, a luxury that many of us have uh, for doing things simultaneously. And um, uh, another kind of benefit of the uh, elutriator is that you can take multiple fractions uh, off of the system. I mean, you can take up to six fractions on a, on, on a, uh, a Beckman Coulter uh, Austria cell sorter, for instance. Uh, and uh, magnetic bead separation, you know, typically it's, it's just two fractions. Uh, but the elutriator, you can take many fractions if that's what you want to do. We'll be illustrating some cases where, you, where that's what we want to do, and then there's other cases where we just want uh, one fraction in particular. Uh, and just to get back to the issue with cell sorting, since we work, since we work in a cell sorting uh, facility, uh, the issue uh, there is that the, the machine is, is, in a way, it's a, it's a serial machine. It's one cell after the other, and and uh, they have to be passed through some sort of a uh, droplet uh, generating system. Now there are other types of cell sorters that are coming down the pike uh, that may uh, challenge some of these, uh, some of this uh, uh, long-standing uh, 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 limitations. Uh, but we'll, let's just focus right now on the on the more traditional cell sorting unit. Um, the droplet size really is uh, important 
consideration because the cells have to be, you can't make a, the droplet has to enclose the cell and it can't be very close to the size of the cell. Uh, it has to be you know, three to four times the size of the cell. Uh, and um, this is this this is a concern because that res that uh, all of the uh, the cell sorting um, uh, droplet generation and fluidics it's all defined by physics and there's only so much you can do there's only uh, there's only uh, so much you can do before the cells start to complain because they've been squeezed into too tight of a droplet or they've been pushed through with too high pressure basically it's an issue of how many droplets can you make per second, and that's the best that you could, you could ever do as far as how, how fast you could sort it. Because if you can make 100,000 cells per second, if in a perfect world, you could sort 100,000 per second, but uh, that doesn't even exist. And, and there's a reason for that. Uh, the, the reason for that is, is that um, uh, cell delivery, uh, the cells uh, entering into the flow and are, are entering those droplets randomly. And in this chart, you can see that, uh, and this is basically just uh, looking at Poisson statistic, arrival time uh, specific uh, uh, statistics and, and plotting this out, that you can see as you increase, um, you increase the droplet generation um, uh, with 100, 100 kilohertz means 100,000 droplets per second, you, uh, you can increase the uh, the yield, the number of um, of, uh, oops, hold on, of the cells that you're getting out of the system, uh, but you're still only at about uh, well, I mean you can pick your you can pick your number where you want to be, but at a typical setting of uh, of a hundred thousand, uh, I think people are usually operating at about twenty five thousand. Uh, cells per second, which gives you about an 80% yield. Uh, so 20% of the material is just not being processed because it's arriving into the system randomly. And uh, a cell sorter can uh, can note that. And the preference, of course, is for purity. And uh, if multiple cells are uh, coming through at the same time, uh, they are not sorted. Uh, they are it's called aborted. They're not looked at. Uh, they're looked at, but they're not sorted. So this is where the cell loss occurs. And as you continue uh, uh, the uh, the flow rate, as you continue to try to go faster and faster, you uh, start to get uh, less and less material. So it's diminishing returns. You're not going to uh, be able to sort uh, very fast. Now, of course, if you have a number of these sorters uh, at, uh, running at the same time, well, that's that's better. But as I said, it's hard to do that. There are some microfluidic approaches that are coming down the pike that may that may make this a little bit. Uh, um, more of a competitor, but for throughput, the cell sorter uh, isn't going to be uh, the highest throughput. Of course, it's going to probably be the highest purity. So let's uh, talk briefly about some of the things that have already been uh, commonly uh, performed using uh, an elucidator. Um, the, probably the most widely used application is uh, cell cycle synchronization. Uh, and uh, we can, uh, we'll talk about uh, the benefits there. Uh, and um, and uh, we've actually started to do that. So these established applications are things that can already be moved into uh, a core setting. So uh, yeah, this stuff has been well worked out. There are many papers, many cell types that have been been looked at. So this is kind of uh, uh, you know a number of applications that you can that you could quickly move into uh, a core environment. Uh, uh, like I said, having it, having a, a setup like this in a core environment uh, with uh, with staff uh, gaining expertise in the system, uh, you can really you know an institute would really benefit from from having this uh, as an offering because you could you could process many cell different types of cells in many different scenarios, uh, whereas in a lot of cases in the past I. Uh, I, I think the the elucidators have ended up just working in, in, in one particular aspect of their of their uh, 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 of their capability, and and then after the experiment's done, um, the elucidator probably uh, doesn't see a lot more action. Um, also, enrichment of cell uh, subpopulations from a cell mixture is, is widely done. Monocyte uh, purification is, is, is widely performed also. So these are existing applications that can easily be pl plugged into a, into a core environment. So um, I'll just show you some, a, a couple of examples uh, out of our lab. This is a cell uh, cycle synchronization. 
uh, using the lutriator, and these are drug uh, cells, uh, T cell leukemia solely. And what we can see here are the uh, on the left uh, frame is the uh, the starting population, the, uh, the the cells directly out of the out of the incubator, uh, and uh, for those who are um, uh, not familiar with looking at the, 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 the cell sorter data, uh, this fraction here uh, represents uh, G0, G1, uh, cells that are uh, 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 not cycling, haven't replicated uh, their, uh, their, their DNA. Uh, we have uh, cells in S phase that are, that are, uh, whoops, that are uh, within this range here. And then uh, finally, we have cells uh, that are uh, ready to divide or dividing D2 and M uh, are sitting right here. So the goal of synchronization is to get every, all the cells into the same uh, cell cycle compartment, and then things can be tested with, uh, with, with drugs or, or, or molecular techniques, uh, whatever. Uh, the, uh, the benefit of cell cycle synchronization using elutriation is that this can be done without treating the cells in any way. Uh, the synchronization is done a number of ways currently, uh, usually involving some type of chemical treatment, like uh, blocking an S phase using hydroxyurea or thymidine block uh, or serum starvation to uh, keep cells back in G0 and then, and then allowing them to move out uh, into cell cycle by adding serum. Um, there is one technique that can be used uh, that doesn't uh, require, there is one technique other than elutriation that can be used uh, that doesn't require uh, treatment, and that's a mitotic shake, uh, mitotic shake off of adherent cells where uh, cells, adherent cells will, will ball up when they're in mitosis, and the uh, point of adhesion to the plastic uh, uh, culture plate is minimized, and if you and if you sharply wrap that uh, flask, the mitotic cells will float up. So there is, you know, so that so that is a competing technology. Of course, that only works for adherent cells, whereas the lutriator can work on uh, quite well on non-adherent cells as well as in here as well as adherent cells. Um, so we talked about the established application using. Uh, 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 removing cell populations, and it's, there are there are just tons of cells that that have been uh, and cell types and cell uh, cell fragments. It, there's been a lot of work, and if uh, if you uh, uh, go online and, and, and search on elutriation uh, of your particular cell type, you might you might find that it's been been done. Uh, a lot of work with liver. Uh, and and there, there are a lot of conditions that have already been established. So this is, this is showing a number of, uh, of different uh, uh, cell types in the liver uh, that could be isolated with uh, uh, showing the, uh, the speed. As I said, the RPM is held constant. And then you can see the flow rate in mLs per minute uh, to elutriate these different fractions, uh, SEC, sinusoidal endothelial cells, uh, the the IDAR cells are hepatic uh, stellate cells. Uh, there's BECs, uh, biliary epithelial cells. So these all have established conditions uh, for elutriators, and um, th this already is something that can be plugged into into a core setting. Um, again, here are some other uh, cell types: CHOs, uh, uh, MUNJACs, uh, murine free B cells. Uh, note here that. Uh, uh, we see some of the uh, the G forces uh, in the uh, in the column there. It's a centrifugal force of elutriation. So uh, these forces are th these are typical. Uh, we're looking at um, uh, we're looking at uh, 600, 700, up to even maybe a, a, a thousand G, give or take. Um, for, for some of these populations, and, and in most cases, they seem to withstand this quite nicely. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the the the, the entire setup. Uh, and, uh, and and uh, by the way, the flow rates where it says ml per minute, uh, they're they're bracketed in, uh, in the CHO cells. Uh, you see 12 to 49. That, those are centered around the mean. The flow rate is really determined by the cell diameter and and uh, and. Uh, 
uh, and we'll talk uh, we'll talk about that uh, actually determining the the settings in in in, in a minute. Um, here we have an example from our lab of um, of a, a, a co culture urothelial cells with three T three feeders, and uh, these uh, it's bovine uh, urothelial cell culture, and we can see uh, pretty effective. Um, removal of three T3s in urothelium uh, using the elutriator from the starting population in the left frame. So uh, just an illustration from, from, our, from our own lab uh, of, of, of what can be done. So um, just show you briefly the, the workflow um, on, on how we, uh, we, we pursue this and, and, and refine this technique. Uh, uh, the sample needs to be monodispersed. So this is another uh, ver requirement that's very similar to what you see in a flow cytometer. We have to have single cell suspensions. Uh, clumps and aggregates will actually uh, uh, disrupt the elutriator and really is critical that these samples are monodispersed. So of course, uh, we can uh, check these under a microscope. It's, it's really highly advised to do that to make sure that you've got a very good single cell prep. Um, uh, and then the step two, evaluating the cell size. This is this is critical because this uh, the cell size of the cells of interest. Okay, you need to you need to be able to 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 look to, to find out what that cell size is. It's really best to 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 um, to actually measure that. And there's a number of ways to do to do that. Um, and you can, uh, in addition, evaluate using flow cytometry. You can use that to kind of hone in on the population of interest. Um, once this is all done, uh, step two actually helps you to set up the centrifugal elutriator, and, and I'll show you a couple of uh, points on that in a, in a, in a, number, in a few slides later. Um, but initially, the first run on, a, on an elutriator is typically a trial run, so this, is, this will be on a, um, a fraction of the material uh, just to, get the, to make sure that the elutriator settings are working. There is a bit of an art to this, so we need to make sure that everything is, is behaving properly. So um, the, um, uh, we collect uh, fractions at different buffer flow rates. And remember the buffer, the, the, the flow through buffer flow rate um, has the effect of uh, 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 elutriating out larger cells when the, when the flow rate is higher and smaller cells when it's slower. Uh, and then uh, step five, we evaluate those fractions to, uh, and that's typically done using a flow cytometer, or you could do it by measuring cell size um, to see if we're getting the target population and see how well we're doing. Um, if, uh, and, usually, and more often than not, uh, in our lab, we find that uh, that, that first run, we're, with, the, with a good cell size measurement, we're pretty, much, we're pretty close to where we need to be. Uh, we, we kind of know approximately where the fraction will will be in the, in the multiple fractions. And the multiple fractions are there to just bracket around where the ideal, the ideal speed, uh, the ideal flow through speed. But if uh, further fine tuning is needed, then we just bounce back up to step four and we do another run. We just uh, uh, dial in some different settings. And then finally, when we've optimized the system, then we can just move up to the actual experiment with the actual material and collect the desired uh, uh, Target cell, of course, we can again evaluate that on a flow cytometer to make sure that this is um, this is the right um, uh, the right fraction. Of course, uh, cell counting uh, as well as cell sizing, uh, you can attempt to do that on a hematometer. It's kind of tough. Uh, you know, having an automated system like a vice cell is uh, really handy uh, for this workflow. Uh, you can get your, your, your answer uh, with, with a high degree of accuracy. And then the other thing that is really difficult to do manually is to, is to, is to um, get a feeling for the distribution of sizes, uh, if there is a distribution. And that, that can be handy if there's a lot of cells in cell cycle, and, and, uh, and as well as cells that are not cycling, you can see, the, you can see those, those two sizes and, and, and can work from there. So, um, what you do with the information from the cell sizing and from the cell numbers is decide what elutriation chamber to use. Uh, we're, uh, here are three different elutriation chambers that we have in our lab. Uh, the standard elutriator is on the left. It's kind of hard to see uh, the chamber in that one, but it's, it's kind of in, uh, it starts here in this little triangular setting there. So that's, the, uh, that's where the chamber uh, sits in that unit. And then um, the Sanderson chamber is a modification, and this is the one that came out in uh, the mid-70s, the mid um, to, uh, to help with uh, 
to help resolve populations a little bit better. Uh, there's some controversy out there as to if it's how beneficial this unit is. We're using it primarily for in our work, um, and um, and I think a lot of folks are using it. Um, uh, there is some advantage, specific, uh, particularly if you're talking about blood cells. Uh, the large Sanderson chamber uh, allows you to just um, just process more more material. It's got a bigger volume, so you can see that 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 area is, is larger there. Uh, and this shows uh, this this table shows the different chambers, uh, the standard chamber. Uh, which we have, the Sanderson chamber, which we, we have. We, the large chamber is actually one that we don't have in our lab. Uh, that is uh, very similar to the standard chamber in its profile. It's just bigger. Uh, and the large Sanderson chamber is not listed here. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's got different parameters uh, for, for operation. Uh, and this tells you a little bit about how to get the, get the instrument set up, how to get that chamber set up, but, but also how the um, how, how much material can be loaded effectively into these chambers. Uh, of course, all of this uh, gets back to the physics, and uh, the basis of elutriation is Stokes' law, uh, which describes sedimentation velocity. Uh, there, here's all the information. Uh, there is a link uh, that we've provided uh, on this webinar to the Beckman Coulter uh, manual for uh, centrifugal elutriation. Where this is, uh, where actually I I I, uh, I, I grab this information. Uh, for those of you who are uh, are interested in uh, in the nitty gritty uh, mathematics, this just uh, works. This this Stokes law applies to the sedimentation velocity, but that's not all you need because ultimately what you want to do is uh, a little bit of mathematical gymnastics to get to the final equation, which is uh, down here. Oops, which is down here, which equates um, uh, uh, cell size to uh, RPM, which we usually keep constant, and uh, and also uh, factors in uh, a uh, given uh, uh, chamber information. All of this stuff is available uh, in the manual that uh, 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 the, these parameters. But uh, this is the Sanderson chamber. But the bottom line is that equation can either be uh, uh, utilized on a nomogram, where you would uh, just pick your cell size, uh, the RPM, and then you can see what the uh, what the best. Uh, the goal here is to find out what the loading uh, uh, speed is, is how is is the the fluid flow rate, and uh, and you can see that here. Or alternatively, what we've done in our lab is we've just uh, we've just put it into a little spreadsheet so we can we can put these numbers up whenever we need them. So one uh, uh, kind of newer approach uh, that, that that we're taking in our lab is uh, to use the elutriator uh, to remove small debris uh, from samples that have been uh, that 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 can cause the cell sorter some problems. Uh, the reason why. Uh, we need to do this is, uh, is uh, and, and in a flow cytometry lab, uh, people are often presented with samples that are made from primary tissue where there's a lot of enzymatic digestion, uh, some sort of sample preparation that uh, results in a lot of debris. This is kind of common. Uh, the machine sees the debris. If, if, if you allow the machine to see the debris, which it, people will debate if that's a good uh, uh, to allow it or not, the machine needs to see the debris in order to avoid the, the, the debris. If, uh, there's, a, there's a thresholding that you can do on a cell sorter where you don't see the debris, but if it doesn't see the, if the machine doesn't see the debris, it can't decide that uh, not to sort it, and you might. Uh, you might retain a lot of debris in the sorted sample, and this could have some implications in genomics applications or other downstream applications. So uh, many labs will uh, uh, will allow the cell sorter to see the debris so that they can try to uh, try to avoid it. Uh, the problem is the debris is all over the place in some of these uh, some of these preparations. So we saw this uh, the elutriate, the centrifugal elutriation as a, as a potential here for for cleaning up these types of samples. Um, as a first step before cell sorting. And uh, in our lab, we've been able to 
uh, we, we've started to work on this and have uh, basically what we're doing here is we're eluding away the small debris and retaining the cells in the in the elutriation chamber. So uh, as as opposed to other techniques where you use a certain elutriation uh, setup in order to elude out a, a population of interest like like a like a G0 G1 population. In this case, we're eluding away the stuff we don't want. We're we're, we're letting all of the debris and everything go away uh, and setting the machine up so that we optimally retain the cells of interest. So basically, we're just, we're just, if we have a cell that's 10 microns, for instance, we're eluding away things that are, that are smaller than 6 microns, for instance, and that gives us good retention. Um, and uh, the other nice factor here, besides you know, what we've talked about earlier and that you don't have to label the cells, you don't have to process the cells, and it's a general procedure, is that this sample cleanup can be performed very rapidly. and this would be a pre-processing step before going on a cell sorter, so you get more efficient cell sorting uh, and, and, and so forth. One other uh, potential, potential use here uh, is uh, for, loading, uh, for loading some of the, uh, I'm sorry, I, I got ahead of myself there. Uh, um, this is just an example uh, to, to maybe better make the point of, of, a, of a sample that has um, some uh, uh, this uh, this is small material. This is debris. Uh, uh, we're pointing here. This this uh, red labeled material. These are the cells of interest. These are these are uh, monocytes in a uh, in a, 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 a oops, in a pancreatic um, um, uh, tumor uh, prep. And uh, in this case, we're looking to get the, the, the monocytes out. This is an illustration of, of, a, of, a, of a potential problem. This is not an elutriation result that, I'm, that we're showing here at the moment. Uh, but basically, the question is, can, can, uh, can you get these, these cells out, which, which are here, but with minimizing the amount of this small contamination that, uh, from small material that comes along. So we see the elutriator as a, as a good first step to cleaning this up. Um, the uh, the way we're we're doing this is uh, to just hone in on these on these cases. We've got a model system that uses jerked cells. Uh, uh, we can do one of two things with the jerked cells. Uh, if we leave them in the refrigerator for a couple of days, we get dead cells and debris uh, that come that come with the. Uh, we just keep them in uh, in PBS with with fetal bovine serum, uh, and that's a nice that's a nice model for us. Uh, and uh, we use that, and here's an example of removal of debris uh, uh, using using the elutriator. Um, one other, uh, sorry about the, the New York City street sounds. Uh, one of the one of the uh, advantages also that we see for this is uh, for single cell genomics for folks who have uh, uh, who are now using some of the fluidine products like the C1. Uh, where cells are loaded uh, and the machine then partitions them out in, in, into their individual, um, um, into individual uh, uh, reaction vessels or reaction chambers. The cells are introduced here. I mean, that's simply put cells in and then the machine pushes them through into, into this, this area. Um, one of the issues with the system is, is, effective lo is, is efficient loading of the system and we feel uh, that uh, we can, we can uh, uh, help out with that also by using the, um, by using the elutriator. So uh, as a summary, um, we pointed out a couple of things here that the elutriation uh, can be a useful addition to a Flossett Helmer laboratory and it can become one of the services that the Flossett Helmer lab offers. Uh, and um, that's a, a great place for this technology to land because the, the uh, core facility has the expertise um, and um, uh, we see applications uh, in addition to the established applications of, of um, synchronization of cells or removing um, uh, cell populations from a heterogeneous mixture, we see uh, this uh, 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 elimination of debris is, is another uh, another benefit that we that we're that we're utilizing in our lab, uh, and of course the benefits that we had pointed out earlier that it re that it requires no, no labeling or treatment is a general procedure, and we can purify large numbers of cells. So the, the, in summary, that's that, that's where we're at right now in my laboratory, and and we're pursuing this further.
So um, in conclusion, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Michael Gregory, who's the lab manager at the NYU Langone Medical Center Core Flow Cytometry Facility, who has done uh, most of this work that, that has been presented. Uh, in addition, uh, the other members of our lab, uh, Nicole Hansen, uh, Camilla Ryan, and uh, Keith Kobolars, and uh, 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 have, have had some, some input into this work, so, so, I, so I'd like to acknowledge them. And then finally, uh, I'd like to acknowledge Beckman Coulter uh, Life Sciences for their support, uh, Chad Schwartz and Randy Lochner, uh, and for, for, uh, for their help. Uh, they've really facilitated a lot of this work. So uh, with that uh, done, I think we have a couple more minutes for some questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter, for the uh, presentation. Uh, very well spoken, uh, succinct material. Uh, looking forward to uh, the uh, next in the series uh, that we have planned with you this year. We do have time for one or two questions, and uh, of course, we will uh, take all of the questions that we have received in the chat window uh, and provide them to Peter uh, for his review to provide written answers and uh, send that out uh, to all of the attendees of the webinar. So we will try to answer your question uh, one way or another. Um, Peter, uh, th there were some themes here and uh, one question, especially, well, since I'm moderating today, I, I get to decide. I'm going to ask you this one because it's an area of excitement for me and uh, overlaps with our other webinar series. And that is, uh, you know, would, would you be able to potentially separate uh, extracellular vesicles that are submicron in size using this technique? Oh, thanks for that question. Um, yeah, you know, uh, that, that, that's interesting. Um, you know, what we're doing right now is, is uh, essentially throwing that stuff away uh, in, in, our, in our small particle cleanups uh, uh, work. But um, there, uh, I, I believe there has been utility of, for elutriators in the past for picoplankton, and, and, uh, and that is getting into about the size range of, of, the, uh, of these uh, microparticles. So I, uh, I would uh, expect that this could uh, be done. Uh, we haven't been looking at that, but it's, it's a very uh, hot um, topic right now in, in, in a lot of fields. And um, in, you know, we, we will probably be, be looking at this uh, you know, on our systems with the current uh, commercial avail commercially available chambers um, you know, possibly we may discover that there, there may be a need for, for some modification of a chamber or something, but, uh, or, or modifications to the loading buffers or whatever, or, or some kind of uh, uh, change that can, that can, can be had with, uh, with the current equipment. But I think there's a very strong possibility that, we, that, 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 this, that this should be possible. Okay, thank you very much for that information. Uh, another question, uh, one that uh, came in from uh, uh, Europe. Uh, uh, what is the precision of the instrument in terms of uh, cell size? Uh, is it able to, for example, differentiate between three and four micron cells? Um, I've seen reported about a half of micron uh, in using the Sanderson chamber. Uh, you know, the there are ways of improving resolution if you if you have a known size range like the uh, like was asked the four to five micron size range. Um, it's possible to get higher resolution uh, of separation by speeding up the uh, by speeding up the uh, RPMs by keeping it at, uh, currently we do 2,500 RPM. If you go to a higher range, you can take a, a, a you can take a size 
the size range and kind of expand it and get and get some further fractionation. We we haven't uh, we haven't explored that, but I think right now what I what I seem to remember being reported was about a half a micron. Uh, questions about uh, number of cells and uh, maximum. So uh, maybe I'll ask uh, uh, in two ways. Um, are there any minimum number of cells uh, to separate uh, starting points, uh, percent recoveries of the technique? And then another question, uh, is there a maximum concentration of cells while injecting, which uh, seems to be a bit similar? Um, yeah, a, a, a couple of uh, a couple of points. There is a um, uh, effectiveness of of loading, and it seems to fall off on the small side. So if if loading if we're loading you know numbers with numbers of ten to the fifth or ten or so start to become difficult. There's a lot of you seem to start losing a lot more material when you get that small. Now. Uh, that is with the current uh, chamber setups and so forth. Um, the, um, on the high side, the material does get diluted. Uh, if, if, uh, I don't know if I can pull back the, um, uh, to the um, uh, delivery system. I can here uh, if, if everybody can see that. Um, the material is introduced into that uh, unit. Um, and uh, and it's it's effectively diluted. I mean, it's the same number of cells that end up in the in the uh, centrifuge. Uh, so you know, like a um, like any other type of uh, of gradient, uh, there's probably an overloading uh, condition where you've got just too much material in there. Uh, there are probably ways around this. Uh, I have seen some modifications to the delivery system where you can process a lot more material. There are, there are ways to skin the cat for sure. Uh, the, the, uh, the information in the manual uh, for the uh, existing chambers, oops, sorry, uh, will, will illustrate, um, uh, I'm not getting to it quickly, no, it's not it, sorry. Uh, will illustrate what the kind of, what the ranges are, uh, okay, here it is, what the ranges are for these, for these current chambers. Um, but uh, uh, you know, there's, there's 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 a lot of latitude, but you're not seeing numbers like ten to the fifth on there because you you start losing material when you go on to the small side. Okay, uh, we actually have uh, quite a few questions coming in, so. I am going to ask one more question and then uh, uh, close out the uh, the webinar because we are already uh, just a bit over the time that we allotted. Uh, one last question for today live. Uh, is there a way to separate cells of different sizes uh, but the same mass? And uh, we had a, a similar c c question that was the converse. Uh, wh what, a, what does this based upon? Is it density, uh, mass, uh, for example, if you have something that is uh, the same size but different masses, can you separate that with uh, elutriation? Um, so you know, some some there is some uh, drag effect here because because you you, you do have a fluid flow. Um, the uh, it's really the sedimentation velo uh, velocity uh, that that that's kind of the prime component of the um, of the technique. Um, you you can exploit some of these differences by changing. Um, uh, uh, by 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 changing the buffer uh, and actually putting uh, 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 gradient type buffers into the system, um, you know these things are um, uh, can certainly be played with. You know a lot of this is just determined by by uh, by the experiment. So uh, you know I would I would I would not dismiss any of these uh, possibilities. I would I would certainly try them out, especially if you can do it in a controlled way.
Professor Lopez, thank you very much uh, for today's seminar. And to all the attendees, thank you for joining us today. The webinar will be made available on demand. Uh, please uh, uh, check back to our, web, uh, our website frequently for uh, future webinar topics. And thank you again for joining us today.